School for Slurp Vision, and this is part of our Australian Winemaker Series. I'm here with Tim James from Hulaga 100 today, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yes. Um, could you start by telling us a little bit about the winery and maybe, first of all, I'm really curious about the name, Wollonga 100. What does that stand for? It's really uh, the, the whole of the Wollonga area in McLaren Bar. There's uh, an old floodplain and there are some very, very old red gums. And this is named after one particularly old, 100 year old, it's now over 100 years old, yeah. a big red gum in the middle of the valley. Um, excellent. And so the region you're from is McLaren Vale. Can you tell us a little bit about the climate and it's, what it's like? Yeah, sure. It's, it's a very Mediterranean climate. We're very close to the sea and uh, we have a large range of, of old hills behind us, up to about 350, 400 metres high, coming down to a valley that goes right through to the sea and it was the site originally of a, an old glacier that went right down through to the sea. So there's a lot of, you see river rocks quite high up because they've turned over by ice. Wow. Millions of years ago, it's great. Um, and what grape varieties are you predominantly working with? We, we're working with Shiraz mainly and Grenache and some Cabernet Sauvignon and Pinot Gris and Viognier. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't mind, I want to ask you a few little topics that you could comment on for us, just to kind of a thumbs up or thumbs sure. down sure. and just let us know your thoughts. Um, organic wine. Yeah, it's a sideways. Of it. <laughs> I, I think there are some fantastic organic, organic wines, and I, there, there is a trend in a bit of cultural sense for us to go from where we've traditionally been to organic and even to biodynamic vineyards. And that's certainly a process that's happening right through our, our region and through Australia in general. But a lot of organic wines I've seen haven't lived up to quality expectations right. that I would have hoped. Biodynamics. I think. Um, I think. That, well. Again, that's a sideways one, and I hate, I hate to hover about that, but the thought is anything to do with soil health is a fantastic benefit to us. Some of the religious aspects to biodynamic viticulture to me is a bit fuzzy. And I'd like to see some more science on it, but the fact is if it improves soil health, then it's a good thing. Mm. A great thing. But you wouldn't necessarily go out and get a certificate for it? Just no, something. I'm more involved in using the pr principles of uh, biodynamic viticulture that I see that are positive and would help right. soil health, and we do that now. Right. Natural wines? Natural wines, if you're talking about wines that are made um, without the addition of SO2. It's um, been a big trend here in Europe and the UK. I think France is really kind of pushing it so much, so I'm curious to see what... Yeah, well, I think there's a thumbs up to that, in a sense that... Uh, if we can come up with the same wine quality and we can do it naturally, mm -hmm. you'd, you'd be surprised how much wine is made like that in Australia anyway. Oh, yeah, screw caps. A big, a big plus. Um, if you're making cars and one in six cars had three wheels that worked and one that didn't, you'd go broke. Mm -hmm. It's a fact of one in six percent. Right. And maybe we're down out of three percent, but it's still, TCA is still an occurring fact through natural cork. And, We've been very forgiving, the wine public have been very forgiving, perhaps partly because they didn't understand, you know, that, that finite difference between those that are mildly affected and, yeah. and not. But um, you just shouldn't be buying a, a defective product. Robert Parker. Uh, I, I think from, from my perspective, um, Robert Parker has probably caused, and, and it's not, it's the regime of Robert Parker. I'm not specifically aiming this at Robert Parker because there are people who work for him that are Parkerised as well. But the difficulty is that in Australian sense, he's promoted wines that are, you know, often with alcohols above 16%, that I don't think is the direction that Australia wants to go in and necessarily does have to go in. And they're big, jammy, overripe wines that lack finesse. Kind of pigeonholing. So pigeonhole. Yeah. He has very much pigeonholed Australia. And I, that's what I don't like about it because we are making some very fine, elegant wines. Yeah, there's more variety to it than just big Shiraz. Yeah, Could you tell us some about some of the trends that might be going on in Australia? Well, I, I think you've covered, Victoria, some of them already. We've, in, in a viticultural sense, I think moving more towards non interventional viticulture and selecting the regions now that are more suited to particular varieties. If you look at the way you know, Australia's only been making wine for a short period of time and we tended to plant every variety in every area. Mm -hmm. As we develop, now we're finding out varieties are more suited to particular regions right. and we're learning more about styles and, and so it's, it's that combination of style, region and um, getting that together with soil and we're becoming more regionally oriented 
we need to tell the rest of the world about right, it. And right. That's what we haven't done well so far. Click on the bottle of your choice for a tasting review with the winemaker.